Trigger warning. This podcast episode contains mentions of emotional and narcissistic abuse. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Emotional Abuse is Real. I'm your host, Serene Leeds, and I'm so glad you're here. I'm thrilled to announce that as of today, this podcast boasts well over 2,000 downloads. So I just want to take a moment to thank everyone who has listened, subscribed, rated, and reviewed this podcast so far, as well as the kind folks who have personally reached out to let me know how grateful they are that this podcast exists. I really didn't know if I was going to make any sort of impact when I started this podcast, and it means the world to know that I think I'm actually uh, doing some good here. <laughs> uh, I really am so grateful to everyone. However, emotional abuse is real still needs your support. And there are several ways you can do that. First of all, if you're a listener and you've been mulling over sharing your story, please don't hesitate to reach out via Instagram at Serene Leads Rights. That's S A R E N E L E E D S W R I T E S, or via our Emotional Abuse is Real Facebook page, or via email. My email address is hello at sereneleads.com. A reminder that anonymous guests are always welcome. And if you are a mental health professional and would like to offer your clinical insights, I would love to feature you on the podcast as well. Another way you can support Emotional Abuse is Real is by heading over to Apple Podcasts and both leaving a rating and more importantly, writing a review. The more reviews we get, the easier it is for people to find this podcast. Finally, you can support the podcast by following me on Instagram at Serene Leads Rights and following our Facebook page, Emotional Abuse is Real. And if you are able, please consider donating to our Buy Me a Coffee page, which I've linked in the show notes. As I've said many times before, this is a one-woman operation and your donations help fund the podcast's production costs. I'd also like to remind you about my free newsletter. This is a great opportunity to stay up to date on my latest published articles, as well as new podcast episodes. Also, it's a wonderful way to stay in touch with me directly, as I'm using the newsletter as another outlet for storytelling, and to offer my writing and editing services to business owners who are looking to punch up their website, email, or social media copy. Plus, as an added bonus, I send out a free delicious dessert recipe to every new subscriber. I've left the sign-up link in the show notes, and you can also subscribe directly via my website, SereneLeads. On today's episode, I chat with Dr. Stuart Wood. Dr. Wood is a neuroscientist by profession, but in recent years, he's become an ally and supporter of emotional and narcissistic abuse survivors. As a result, he's written and self-published a book called Escaping the Void, How to Support Victims Out of Emotionally Abusive Relationships. Dr. Wood connected with me several weeks ago, and I think listeners will appreciate the different perspective he offers as not a survivor, but as an involved supporter. Before we get into our conversation, please know that I understand the content on this podcast may be difficult for many of you. I've spoken to several people who want to listen to this podcast and who do want to share their stories, but they just don't feel ready to do either yet. I'm here to tell you that I completely understand your decision. As I've done on previous episodes, I am more than happy to narrate your story if you don't feel comfortable appearing on the podcast. Also, please know that it's taken me nearly a decade after my own emotional abuse experience to be able to talk about it so openly. I'm always happy to chat with you over Instagram DM, the podcast Facebook page, or via email. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Dr. Stuart Wood. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, hi, I'm Stuart Wood. I'm uh, a neuroscientist by background, but I have spent a lot of time working in the pharmaceutical industry, particularly with um, medics and clinical trials, that sort of thing. I took redundancy in 2006, and since that time, I've been running my own business, which focuses mainly on helping people get over fears using all sorts of weird and wonderful animals. <laughs> That's awesome. I know I have a lot of animal lovers as my listeners, so um, that's wonderful. So um, on that uh, note, what is your experience with emotional and narcissistic abuse? Uh, how did this topic become so important to you personally and professionally? Okay. Um, over the years, I think I, I've, I'm a bit of a people watcher. Mm -hmm. So when I was working in the industry, uh, you meet a lot of people who stand out for one reason or another. Um, and one of those people was a boss of mine who it works out if he wasn't narcissistic, he certainly had some fairly strong narcissistic traits. Um, basically, it was it was sort of micromanagement or that's what it felt like. And then one day I got into the desk, sat there, thought I'm not doing this anymore and kind of walked out for two years, basically. So I, it was a... I I was on the receiving end of um, what I perceive. I didn't perceive it as narcissism because I knew nothing about narcissism per se at that right. time. But the result of that was that it took me two years to recover from serious depression and sort of rebuild life from the bottom, which rebuilt a lot of good into what had been fairly shaky, really. Mm -hmm. So that was my my sort of personal encounter. Um, but I think also I've, I've seen people who have been quite, the best way is putting it toxic or people always treading on eggshells around them, you know, clinical leaders, people afraid to ask questions or put a foot out of line, that sort of thing. Um, and also some, some fi fairly high level speakers who you would think, gosh, you know, these guys are so confident you know they must be they must be super people but but getting to know them you realize suddenly that they're no different to anybody else they still get dead nervous before they go on stage they go on stage and talk and do a great job so some people i thought probably had more problems than they did didn't and those people who you see and and you sort of just realize there's something wrong by the atmosphere or how people act around them um i met a few of those as well mm -hmm. but most recently um in the really the last five or six years i had a, a friend a couple of friends really who i knew for 10 12 years um and there were just one or two things that came up in conversation when I spoke to one of the, you know, one of the, the couple in on her own, basically. And there were a whole load of just things that made made me react and, and feel as though things were uncomfortable. Um, and very interestingly, at the same time, I watched one of Jay Shetty's very early videos which highlighted yeah. narcissistic abuse. Mm -hmm. And so that was the start of six years of involvement with actually helping someone out of a narcissistic relationship, which is, I guess that's where my, you know, I like to research and I like to know what I'm doing, as you may have already gathered. Um <laughs> 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 but um yeah i we, we sort of worked our way through bumped into loads of dead ends and you know made the mistakes and and learned as we went along but i think there was so much in that experience um that taught me a lot that it it's actually enabled me now with my daughter who is also getting out of an abusive marriage to be able to have some input there but apart yeah. from that, life's quite normal. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> well, you know, from uh, slowly getting to know you through emails and social media and reading um, some of your book, um, I mean, I want to come up with a better word than this, but you really have become an ally to narcissistic abuse survivors. And so that makes you quite unique um, as a guest on this podcast, because I haven't, um, I mean, other than um, a psychotherapist who I've uh, interviewed, I mean, this is definitely a new uh, type of guest, which is why I'm really glad that we connected. And, um, you know, one of the reasons why, well, the podcast, no one's going to be able to see me smiling and nodding my head vis vigorously. But when you were telling me about your personal experience with a boss, I mean, I'm just always not happy to hear those stories, but it's also, it's just a reassurance that I'm not alone because my boss at Rolling Stone was the reason why this podcast exists. My right. personal nar uh, narcissistic abuse, emotional abuse experience actually was not um, a romantic relationship. It was a workplace uh, relationship. And you know, like you, I had no idea what a narcissist was. I called my former boss a narcissist because that's what my therapist told me he was. So I was like, I'm going to trust her. And um, yeah, so uh, from there, you've written a book called Escaping the Void, How to Support Victims Out of Emotionally Abusive Relationships, which is due out later this year. So this is a handbook or a primer, if you will, about narcissistic people and their destructive tendencies. And it offers tips and steps about how people can protect themselves from these kinds of toxic predators. Aside from what you already told me, what was the impetus for writing this book? Um, I think you've you've pretty much hit the the <laughs> nail the nail on the head already. It's the ally okay. thing. I'm yeah. One of the things I I'm fairly tolerant as people mm -hmm. as a person. I'm quite laid back, but one of the things I really hate is injustice. Me too. And, and I think <laughs> having witnessed what went on, particularly with my friend, and mm -hmm. the you know, and and other people that I've got to know since that who've been through similar relationships, there was so much in there that I thought, you know, if I didn't, if I wasn't here doing this now, I would never have known that this kind of stuff went on. It's the, it's the stuff, I mean, the lady, one of the ladies I helped, her comment was, if I submitted my story to Hollywood, it would be rejected as being so far-fetched. Right. Right. So yeah. it's that kind of thing. I think re hearing those sorts of comments and reading about people who have this difficulty of communicating uh, the situation that they're in, you know, they, they take a massive risk by doing that. And then people turn around and say, uh, you've got it wrong. You know, which is the that's yeah. the buzzword of the narcissist anyway, isn't it? You know, yes. I see it this way. No, you've got it wrong or I'm, you're not right or whatever. Yeah. And I think though that sort of thing stirred me up and I thought I, because I am quite analytical mm -hmm. and also because I'm coming at this as someone who's not within the relationship and experiencing it from that perspective, but actually I, I've I've kind of been through it with them in parallel, supporting them, seeing what's gone on, which many, is a real privilege because very few people see that the depths that these guys will stoop to mm -hmm. to get their way. Yeah, um, there was so much in there that that just said, you know, this needs writing down, basically. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that I've always been known for is taking ideas that are quite, you know, complex or whatever and putting them into simple words. So what yes. I wanted to do was try and create something which anybody could pick up and read. Because as as you know, as soon as you get into any speciality like narcissism, you know, triangulation, hoovering, the jargon flows and people use that. Even people who are writing about their own experiences use that. And to someone coming in who doesn't even know about narcissism, it can be a real turnoff, I think. 
Yeah. So what um, what I I just tried to capture the the essence of what was happening, explain it, explain the technical terms as secondary to what was happening, so that people can kind of get hold of the subject and get inside it and, and appreciate it really. I'm really glad that you mentioned about breaking down jargon because that actually was uh, my master's degree thesis. I have no patience for jargon and uh, I because I, I had an experience um, at my daughter's school with some of the, not the teachers per se, but some of the other educators. And I was like, they're not talking to me like I'm a human being. So I'm always happy to meet and talk to and talk about uh, people who are breaking terms down and not getting in the weeds so that everyone can understand what's going on. Because it's so true about... Um, the terms that are thrown around, thrown around with narcissism. And I know that we always have to be careful about label, labeling people a narcissist, especially if we're not mental health professionals, which I am not. So um, awesome. Um, I also just want to say that um, as a rock and roll fan, uh, proud Gen Xer, I really got a kick out of how you name the chapters. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm one of those guys that they say hang arounds with musicians. I'm a, dr a drummer and percussionist, so I've been uh, I've been doing it. I don't know, forty, forty five, fifty years or so. So I yeah. like it's again. It's it's something like that where you can give someone which is it's kind of quite light hearted. But I think what's when you when you see some of those titles, it kind of encapsulates what the chapter is trying to say yes. in five words, really. Absolutely. And I'm sure that that's going to help draw in readers. And um, I'm a, a woman who's married to a musician and I've been a rock singer since God knows how long. So um, so I was very happy to see the Rolling Stones and the Beatles and ABBA and yeah. So don't forget uh, the Eagles, the no. American band, the American <laughs> band as well. <laughs> I'm trying. Don't mention the Eagles because I'll just start quoting the Big Lebowski. So <laughs> I will never no, we will never forget the Eagles ever. So um, uh, since as you're a neuroscientist, would, uh, how is your perspective different from that of, say, a psychotherapist, especially um, pertaining in the book? It's I guess it I don't. A psychotherapist is a professional who's trained to help. I'm I'm basically a layman who happens to have a neuroscientist background. Right. So my I you know, my interest with things like fears is not just the, the principles of if you confront someone with a fear, they can get over it. I'm interested in the I guess the science that goes behind that. So sure. There is the whole neuroscience of how the brain works with memory and triggering and, you know, hormones being released and how the brain switches off and switches on regarding your sort of mental state. Um, mm -hmm. I think when it came to narcissism, I, I was just really interested in looking into, you know, what's the science that backs up the practice. So. Um, and also, is there is there something in there that helps us to explain and understand what's happening? Um, and, and a simple thing that came up was the similarity, for example, between how narcissists work and addictive mm -hmm. practices. So this intermittent reinforcement where, oh, yeah. you know, with the narcissist, yeah. their cycle, they they flood people with lots of presence and it's a it's a sort of regular thing and they get them on a high and then they'll bring them down and then they feed them a yeah. little morsel again of something else that builds them up and before long you yes. you know before they know it you've got this this dependency which is so similar to an addictive dependency both on the part of the narcissist getting their kicks and on the part of the yeah. victim in their response to the narcissist yeah it's it's so true um and there were 
two central messages of your book that really resonated with me. One was the need for long-term strategies when extricating oneself from a narcissistic abuser. And the other one was, because God, I know this so well, was to not fight narcissist abusers because we will not win. So why are both of these things, both the long-term strategies and not engaging in fights with the narcissist, critical for survivor healing? I think, as you've already said, engaging with a narcissist in, in a confrontational situation is a non-starter. That's, what, that's their fuel. That's their oxygen. That's yeah. what, what drives them. And yeah. they're des- desperate for that. So... This whole thing, uh, no matter what yeah. type of narcissist it is, where and there's a whole spectrum of them, as we know, from those who are hidden to those who are kind of out there in your face, um, they all desperately want attention. And any if they can't get good attention, they the, I always think of a narcissist as a child trapped in an adult's body. So basically, you are dealing with oh, a yeah. child. Yeah, totally. You know. Th- that they yeah. um, they kick off and they'll do bad things f- rather than do nothing for the sake of getting some kind of kick, really. So to yeah. actually confront the narcissist is counterproductive because they, they win. And also from a, a point of view of being a victim, you are then exposing yourself. You're triggering some of these really intense reactions, rage, etc., where the risk to yourself or children or whatever is just escalates massively. Um, and sadly, the number of people who die as a result of this kind of thing, you know, is not insignificant. It, it's there. It's a real, a real issue. So, I think. What I was trying to think about was what can we do instead that would turn that on its head? Because what you want to do when you confront a narcissist is to is to tell them they're wrong and actually stop them doing what they're doing to you because it's painful. Yeah. Now, if you confront them, you're not going to do that. Mm-hmm. And so the, the alternative is a strategy that puts puts what I would call boundaries clear boundaries in place with accountability um, that basically yeah. stops yeah. the nar- makes the narcissist irrelevant and ir- invisible because they're not getting their own way and they lose interest and move on. So it's, it's a kind of way of protecting yourself mm-hmm. without too much risk. They just lose interest and, and push off elsewhere. And I think that the long-term strategy is yeah. when, you, you know, Recovery from narcissism is akin to recovery from the battlefield. You know, a lot of the symptoms that people experience are things like post-traumatic stress disorder, complex PTSD, things that are really deep set and take a lot of effort. And a lot of those, those things are to do with the way that we think how we view situations, how we think about ourselves. And whilst the narcissist is on the scene, whilst they're in our head still fighting for attention, you know, I think it's very difficult to break free from whatever it is that's holding on to you. And so to actually give yourself a long-term strategy which allows you to escape but also continue to recover once you're out, discover your true self, realize that everything you've been told by the narcissist is untrue anyway, that you are capable of making your own decisions, you are capable of directing your own life, you are capable of living on your own, you know, or living independent of them. Part of getting to that place is also being able to shed the baggage that they've put on you whilst you've been with them. And therefore, part of that long term strategy is escape, deal with those psychological problems and free yourself then so that you are, you know, you it's at the point, I guess for some people, it's a pipe dream. But to get to that point where you are no longer intimidated or bothered by the narcissist or things that that resonate from what they did in your past. Yeah. 
Yeah. And it's something that even I'm still working on it. I'm, I left Rolling Stone. That's what I had to do. My escape was I had to resign because I just couldn't work with this guy anymore. And it was, you know, it was ruining my life. And that was coming up on nine years ago. So mm. it's taken a long time. And I only started this podcast a few, a few months ago. Um, yeah. I think part of the problem was because, which is another reason why I, I do this podcast is, um, you know, a lot of people still don't take emotional and narcissistic abuse seriously. I mean, for years I was still getting like, Oh my God, I can't believe you like voluntarily left. And it's like, Dude, you did not know what it was like. And, it, you know, I would then have to like sit people down and tell them exactly what I was going through. So, yeah, uh, I could have I could have used uh, more strategies. I mean, I had my therapist. I had my husband. But even even asking like how long it took you to write and research the book. Yeah, it was about probably three or four yeah. years in total. So. When I was going through the experiences with my friend or supporting yeah. my friend th through them, there were a lot of things that I was making mental notes with or writing down. And the whole idea, you know, when we were chatting about stuff, it would come up like, well, this would make a, a great book, you know. So I guess the seeds were sown when I was in there and part of the, the research for mm -hmm. the book itself was done on the job because I was researching how to do the best for someone who sure. is very difficult, finds it very difficult for themselves to think in under that kind of pressure. You know, how can I help them in the best way that I can? How can I, it, what sort of advice can I give for them to consider that's, you know, gold standard stuff rather than just whims and fancies? And so at the same time as, as I was going through it, yeah. helping her or helping her through it, there was loads of research going on on the hoof to keep help me stay in touch and you know try and keep one step ahead of where we were going because I think during the research at first it's it's like there's everything all over the place but you don't with narcissists you don't have to spend that long studying them to realise that. Yeah. Although they're all very different, the the characteristics are so <laughs> textbook. You know, they're desperate to be seen, and they, I think they get seen for all the wrong reasons because yeah. they they they're just uh, from the same mold. You know, in terms of their their the way that, that the expectations and the entitlement and 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 the way that they act. So. I, I, it was it was an ongoing thing whilst we got up until the point yeah. where my friend was able to get a divorce and because she had to live in the house with this guy while she was going through the divorce because he was in control of all the finances, of course. So he kept telling her to leave the house. Oh, yeah. But by the way, I'm not giving you anything to leave with. Mm -hmm. So she was told, you know, or she was recommended by her legal people to stay there, which she did, which made made life you know, a living hell daily. Um, but then once she got out, there was a whole lot of other stuff that, that I yep. then had As to learn. Not the first time I've heard of a story like that. Yeah. Which, which is no long, it's not, you don't learn the stuff when you're in it. You learn as a, as a supporter, you have to learn about the letting go process and all the fallout that comes from that. Because, you know, once people get out at the other end, mm -hmm. they they're finding themselves, and they they get on their own two feet, and they suddenly found find this sense of empowerment, and they start making decisions. And one of those decisions, you know, very often, is that they will look at where they are, and they will say, "Well, okay, you're supporting me, but actually, it, it, you've just been so controlling throughout the whole process," and. And that's part, it's a difficult thing to hear. It's part of their reasoning as they move from being unable to do anything to being in charge. They go through this stage where everything is viewed as polar opposites. Um, and obviously, you know, as thankfully as time goes on, they realise that what was control was actually you making decisions because they weren't able to or you encouraging them to make decisions and steering them in a direction that they didn't particularly want to go, but you knew if they went the way that they were going, they would it would be a lot worse. So I think it, the research has been a mixture of on-the-job learning, 
it's been off the job learning and it's been after the event learning and sure. and then just putting all the bits together and doing the reading around that for you know what what is there to support what I'm thinking what is there that I've done wrong that I could have done better etc so it, it's then the padding to make to build it into a, a complete story what is the one thing that you want the public to know and understand about narcissistic abuse first of all there are two sides to every story so take the opportunity to listen to both parties because one of the dangers mm -hmm. that I've seen of narcissism is they have two faces they're a bit of a Janus you know outside world they're they're charismatic or they're a bit shy and retiring but they're affable and they're nice inside it's a living hell mm -hmm. they're very good at at shielding the outside world from that so when the outside world hears about yeah. that it's disbelief. Mm -hmm. So because of that, I mean, I'll give you one example with this friend of mine who was, she was actually quite involved in a church in leadership. And she'd been, she'd been talking to people about her uncertainties. There were certain things going on in the marriage that she wasn't happy mm -hmm. about at all. And within the leadership, you know, at that time, she was told, well, that sounds like an abusive situation to me. And then, but, you know, our recommendation is that you go back and you learn to love him more or you find ways to love him. Mm -hmm. Now, in a normal relationship, that's fine. But as we know, with a, you know, part of the reason I call the book Out of the Void is there are narcissists for a black hole that suck, you know, and there is no two way relationship. So, when she actually, when everything kicked off and she told him that she was leaving, first yes. person he went to, because of course they do all the research, was to go to the leadership team, inform her that she'd been having affairs, which was totally untrue. Um, what happened then was that the leaders listened to him, despite knowing the facts, <sighs> and took the decision yeah. that they were going to stand yeah. with him. So she had to leave the church. In the space of two weeks, she lost somewhere around about 400 friends, so was totally isolated, which, of course, was exactly where he wanted her because then she got no way of feeding back. When she actually tried to tell them what was going on in reality, they oh. said, sorry, that you know, you're lying, basically. We don't believe you. So despite having told them, even when yeah. this situation arose they still sided with, with the narcissist. So, you know, I just use that as an wow. example of how, how dangerous these people really are. And if, if someone takes the, has the courage to share with you about their story and about their concerns and what's going on, listen. You know, we have an obligation to listen because I think somewhere in the book I say our failure to act could result in another gravestone. And that's that's not being dramatic. That's what the statistics yeah. tell us. So, OK, there might not have been any abuse, any physical abuse, mm -hmm. but with the not with emotional no. abuse, the danger is that you've got yeah. this this little ticking time bomb, which if they suddenly go off on one. Right. That can then be the one time they're physically violent, which is the one time that, you know, the other person dies. It, it's 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 grossly under undervalued uh, or under un, you know, misunderstood condition because the word narcissist is banded around so generally as someone who's a bit awkward. Well, you know, I would love to get those people in rooms with real narcissists, spend in those rooms for a day and then come out and decide whether they're a, a little bit awkward. You know, I think it would. And I, that's my my thing here with the book is, is that the aim is it's it, yes, it's a handbook for those people who want to get out. But also it's about educating the populace, you know, and there's a lot of information out there, but unless you actually take that information, apply it and make it happen, mm -hmm. then the information is largely impotent. You know, it, it's, yeah. it, it's pretty useless. So I would say listen to people who are in abusive relationships, 
be very, very careful what yeah. you do with that information. You have to be, you know, completely keep the confidences, et cetera. If you're not, if you don't feel able to help, which for a lot of us, it's very overwhelming when you hear these stories, point the people in the direction of agencies that specialize mm-hmm. in this kind of abuse, which are different on, you know, in America and the UK and Spain and everywhere else. But there are local organizations and charities that specifically work with sure. that, that area you know get them in touch with people who can help yeah but do not ignore them it's it's not a trivial matter it's a, it really is a matter of life and life and death i think more prevalent today because the culture encourages it the you know totally. the individualism the the ideal life all the things that the narcissist aspires for are becoming integrated in society which makes it then more difficult to spot yeah the outliers and where you know where things really are bad yeah I just really appreciated what you said about not to ignore people when they're trying to tell their stories because that's what happened at my job at Rolling Stone because no one knew what to do and they didn't want to get involved. And, you know, so, and, and that hurt me almost Mm. as much as the actual emotional abuse. So, so I appreciate your saying that very much. Um, so how can people get in touch with you? Uh, social media, this is, uh, just want to give you an opportunity to, uh, give a website, social media contacts, the yeah. the web the website is not up and running yet, but the idea is out of the book that we that there will be a website starting, which is basically narcissistic dash abuse dot net. Okay, which is looking at being uh, drawing in you know together a community of people who are suffering, have suffered, but also putting people in contact with professionals that can help. But I also see it moving on, you know, whether it'll happen in my lifetime, I don't know, but I see it as becoming something which is much more of a lobbying is probably the wrong word, but becoming a voice for emotional abuse, particularly in getting things changed within the law within training for professional organisations who should recognise it but don't, et cetera, mm-hmm. you know, and getting changes in procedures that mean that these people are not only not only protecting the, um, you know, the victims or the potential victims, but also dealing mm-hmm. with even that simply if make, by making them irrelevant or whatever, you know, dealing with the, the narcissists and making it ever increasingly difficult for them to have their influence. Just thank you so much for coming and talking with me today and for talking to me about your book. I wish you all the best with it. And, you know, it's just wonderful that we have um, allies for emotional abuse survivors such as yourself. So thank you again. It's a pleasure. I mean, as a a supporter, I think uh, we need more. We need more supporters out there. And as you've said before, it isn't just that people don't want to get involved. I think sometimes when it comes to something this big, people feel overwhelmed and it's, you know, paralysis. Whereas all I can say is no matter who you are, get involved. Yes, you'll run into brick walls. You'll probably have some of the best arguments of your life because that's, that's part of the way. But it's sure, about resilience. Sure. It's about discovering what's what you're doing that's right and keeping doing it. Discovering what you're doing that's not right. Learn from it and 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 correct. Really, but it, it's not a perfect science. It's not that pe- some people are born to be supporters. I think there are a lot more people out there who can support those who are struggling with this kind of abuse. And I would just encourage them. To, you know, if if they do want to get in contact with me about the thing or read a book. Loads of good stuff out there as well. But, you know, do it, please. But remember, you're dealing with human beings and it's not about you. You know, the why is always about helping people stay safe, get out of abusive relationships and have a proper life, really.
Thank you for listening to my conversation with Dr. Stuart Wood on Emotional Abuse is Real. If you would like to connect with Dr. Wood or purchase his ebook, Escaping the Void, How to Support Victims Out of Emotionally Abusive Relationships, which is now available on Amazon for £1.99 or $2.50, I've left all of that information in the show notes. If you would like to share your emotional abuse story here on the podcast, please don't hesitate to reach out at hello at sereneleads.com via our Facebook page, Emotional Abuse is Real, or through Instagram at Serene Leads Rights. Please note that this podcast should not be used as a substitute for professional mental health services. If you are a victim of emotional abuse and need help, please call or text the Suicide and Crisis Hotline at 988 or call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-7233. You can also text START, S-T-A-R-T, to 88788. Once again, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. Follow me on Instagram and on Facebook. And if you can, please support us through our Buy Me a Coffee page. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.